So I'd like to offer a particularly warm welcome to those of you who are new to the Royal Society. The Royal Society is Britain's Academy of Sciences. It's played a major part in some of the most fundamental and significant and life-changing scientific discoveries for more than 350 years. And Royal Society scientists continue to work at that cutting edge and to make a difference in terms of scientific advances. As well as its scientific research, the Royal Society has always been outward looking. In fact, the Royal Society has had a foreign secretary for longer than the British government has had a foreign secretary. <laughs> Uh, and a key part of that outward lookingness is to work at the interface between science and policy and the impact of science on society. The Royal Society does that in a number of, of interesting and important ways, and you'll hear about some of them this evening. As one part of that, in April 2017, so last year, about 18 months ago, the Royal Society launched a landmark report on machine learning, a key part of artificial intelligence. And the report looked at the enormous potential benefits of the technology over the next five to ten years, a number of the challenges for society that may arise because of that, and a key message of that uh, report was that we as society needed to be active in our stewardship as, as machine learning and artificial intelligence developed. So one part of that call for active stewardship is this series of lectures and discussions, the UNAI series of which tonight's lecture is the fifth, and it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome you to that series, and it's part of our aim in the Royal Society to foster that discussion and engagement throughout society with some of what we're all aware will be very, very key issues for society in the years to come. So it's my great pleasure to, to first of all, welcome tonight's lecturer, Professor Joseph E. Stiglitz. Professor Stiglitz is an economist and a professor at Columbia University in New York. His work has had enormous impact in shaping both academic research and thinking and critically shaping policy. He served, amongst other things, as chief economist of the World Bank and contributed to advisory bodies in a number of different countries. He's also written a series of highly influential and popular books that have helped shape the global debates about really critical issues such as globalization, trade, and its impact on economics. He's received many, many accolades for his work, the most significant of which was the award of the Nobel Prize in 2001. We're also very proud that he's a foreign member of the Royal Society. It's my great pleasure to call on Professor Stiglitz to deliver his lecture on the future of work. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, at, at, at the Royal Society and to talk uh, on this subject, which I think is of enormous uh, importance. Uh, there's obviously a lot of anxiety about work in, in all the advanced countries. <clears throat> it's not just about jobs. Um, it's not just about wages uh, and the increasing polarization uh, of the labor force. Uh, it's about inequality, about uh, what would society be uh, without work. And uh, it has many dimensions that I won't be able to go into. Uh, it will affect People of different genders differently, uh, different age groups will be affected uh, differently by some of the changes that we're uh, going to be confronting. It also has uh, very large uh, political consequences. And one of the main themes uh, is uh, that if we don't manage these changes in technology well, uh, the consequences can be very adverse to our society. Uh, if you look at uh, those groups who supported uh, uh, our, uh, I don't know what to call him, uh, <laughs> uh, the person in uh, the White House now, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you realize the, the uh, dangers of not managing it well, the, the, the correlations uh, between those who supported him uh, and uh, unemployment, low wages, um, deindustrialization, uh, the world of work are very clear and, and fairly unambiguous. So if we don't manage this well, uh, we, it will feed not only the nativism that we are experiencing on both sides of the Atlantic, but I think uh, it could well feed a kind of new era of fascism uh, with a lot of remnants, uh, memories of what we happened in the 30s. 
So I'm going to try to uh, describe uh, what, what is going, uh, the challenges that we're going to be confronting in a fairly analytic way, no data. Uh, uh, it's, going to, it's really a conceptual uh, approach to how do you think about it. And um, to, to realize that changes in technology uh, and our learning uh, about the world have really uh, lay, uh, underlay the advances of our uh, society for over 250 years. If you go back in data of uh, uh, look at, at uh, living standards, GDP per capita, whatever measure you use, for hundreds of years there were no changes at all. And then suddenly, around 1750, 1800, in Western Europe, uh, they started to increase and very, very rapidly. And it shows up in other data. Uh, it, in the UK, uh, people love to gather data. And uh, there, we have data of the real wages of London craftsmen, for instance, going back uh, uh, some 800 years. And they have exactly the same pattern of nothing happening until 1750, 1800, and then increasing. And you get the same pattern in longevity. Uh, life expectancy uh, 250 years ago uh, was really very low. And you know, great minds, uh, there was just an interesting play I saw over the weekend about the Bronte uh, sisters. And they died at very young ages. You know, these great creative minds died under the age of 40. And you realize uh, what difference it makes. I mean, somebody like me obviously realizes that uh, uh, what difference uh, uh, these changes uh, in technology uh, have made, and all based really on, on the advances in, in science and technology. So in some ways, what we are seeing in AI is a continuation of those kinds of advances that have gone on for uh, 250 years. But in other ways, uh, they are uh, different. Um, uh, it's, I say more than just the continuation of the process of advances um, uh, in technology, where uh, for a long while uh, we constructed machines that were stronger than any humans. Um, and then we constructed, uh, um, but AI is more than robots, which are stronger than humans. And um, it's uh, more than the kinds of machines that uh, can process information much faster than any of us can process information. Uh, when I was a little kid, uh, we used to uh, live near a, a railroad track, and, we used to, and the railroad cars have long numbers. And uh, we used to be, uh, you know, like, six, seven, eight digit numbers, and we ha used to see if we could, how fast the train could go, and we would still be able to add up the eight digit numbers as they went by. Uh, that's not a game anymore, because we know that computers can outpace us in, in recognizing numbers, and so the ability to add up eight digit numbers uh, very quickly is no longer viewed as a, a particularly worthy skill. Um, but uh, AI, um, is also, and particularly about machines that can actually learn faster uh, than humans. Uh, in many areas, uh, even in quite complicated areas, uh, machines will be able to replace humans. About 100, uh, not quite 100, about 80 years ago, uh, there was a very distinguished uh, Oxford economist, uh, Sir John Hicks, that analyzed uh, the impact of uh, innovation that was occurring at that time. And he, the language that he used was labor-saving versus labor-augmenting innovations. Um, and the language I'm going to use is very similar. We, we could talk about machines, artificial intelligence, that replaces labor, human replacing uh, intelligence, versus uh, those things that actually augment our ability to do things. And we're both familiar, we should be familiar with both kinds. So uh, in the figure here, you know, it used to be thought that 
that artificial intelligence would be really difficult, uh, hard, for those engaged in routine jobs. Uh, anything that were routinized could be computerized, robotized, and uh, those jobs would go. But what we now realize is that there are a lot of things that are actually fairly complicated. Some even having a PhD, MD, uh, those jobs are going to go too. And this picture here is that of a radiologist. Uh, uh, computers can read uh, your uh, MRIs and your CAT scans better than humans can. Uh, it's bad news for radiologists, but the studies that have tried to break down the tasks that uh, people do point out that actually reading these uh, uh, x-rays or, or MRIs is only a fraction, or only part of what people who are trained uh, in these jobs actually do. And so this is an example in part where this will be uh, intelligence assisting because this routine part, the machine will do better than a human, and that means the doctor will be free to do uh, other things. So uh, the point that I want to uh, emphasize is that, that uh, it will have an impact on not just unskilled jobs, but also skilled jobs. But still, the largest impacts are going to be on unskilled jobs. And this was a, a, t a task, uh, driving a truck, that is fairly complicated. Uh, and uh, yet, um, self-driving trucks uh, are anticipated to uh, be uh, dominant within five to 10 years. Uh, they keep postponing the date in which they think it's going to happen. But uh, so two years ago, they told me it was only going to be five years, but now that nobody's talking about three years from now. It's, it's still five years. But uh, it, it will happen. Um, some of this is, is, is a political issue. Um, no, not a, 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 a. These trucks, uh, okay, you know, cars, self-driven cars, uh, occasionally kill people. But of course, so do human drivers. Uh, but when a uh, driverless truck kills somebody, everybody says it's, something's wrong with the technology. And when a human-driven car uh, kills somebody, they don't say, we won't allow any human to drive a car anymore. So we have a bias in favor of humans uh, uh, in this area. Uh, but the, the fact is the ability to uh, respond very quickly to the major factors that could cause an accident uh, is better by a computer than by a human. So that's uh, an area where, where uh, again, there'll be uh, uh, a really uh, re labor replacing. Uh, the reason why this is in part so important is that uh, one of the things that's happened in, uh, in, in the last 35 years is that wages of unskilled workers has declined, uh, or at least not kept up with the pace of wages of people at the top. So that in the United States, for instance, uh, and this is particularly true for males, uh, a full-time male worker, uh, median income, uh, is the same as it was 42 years ago. Uh, no increase in income over 42 years. And the people who have full-time jobs are the lucky ones. They're not the ones who are uh, unhappy in the Midwest and the South. And at the bottom, real wages in the United States are the same as they were uh, 60 years ago. So this uh, replacing unskilled labor is going to be a serious problem. And the largest employer of uh, workers who are not College graduates, you know, or high school graduates, are truck drivers. So, uh, and we're talking about millions of jobs here. So, this is is going to have uh, uh, significant effects, and, and effects uh, about which we ought, ought to worry. Um, uh, as I said, in, in all these areas, uh, robots are actually, or machines are better than humans. Um, there are problems that have been detected, for instance, in facial rec recognition of minorities. Um, there there uh, uh, 
capabilities depend on data that they are given. Uh, and um, what is also striking is that so far in some areas where humans have no difficulty at all, computers have a lot of difficulty, like sewing. Uh, where we think of that as an unskilled job, uh, the computers think of that as a really high-skilled job that they can't, that's beyond their capabilities. Well, um, so there is this, these two strands that I've identified, uh, human replacing machines and human assisting machines. And for the intermediate future, only 30 to 40% of the jobs uh, are a threat. Uh, machines may also increase the productivity and effectiveness of humans. Uh, in the area of science, we all know that many of the may, most important advances in science are because of a new instrument. Uh, it, it, new instruments allow us to see beyond what our uh, human abilities to see were, and those new instruments have posed new problems that we then go about solving. So it's unambiguously clear that, that there are uh, the, these human assisting innovations are going to be important. And the balance of these two, what I call human replacing and human assisting machines, will depend uh, on the extent to which we increase skills in the labor force and, and some things about the nature of the evolution of technology uh, that is, uh, will be difficult for us to uh, uh, predict going forward. So this is just a, by way of background. Uh, we really can't predict precisely how many jobs are going to be replaced, how much productivity is going to uh, increase. But what I want to spend the next few minutes talking about are the economic implications, including the implications uh, more broadly for uh, work. Uh, the, uh, as I said, overall, both of these forms of innovation increase the size of the pie. And if you're wondering about uh, that picture, uh, it took me a while. The, 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 the Royal Society provided that picture for me, and I wondered why, what was that? And I said it was increasing the size of the pie. So they had a baker there uh, baking a pie. So innovation is increasing the size of the national pie, uh, and that's important. But uh, the real debate is about how that pie is going to be divided. And um, uh, so uh, that's really where, where the, uh, 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 the debate is going to be. So right now, uh, th this, the, the left hand is the current system uh, based on uh, uh, a set of data, a standard set of data sets. But what, it, what you see is the gross uh, inequities. Um, the 53%, the blue area, is the income of the national pie that goes to the bottom 90%. And that little slice, don't feel too sorry for them, that gets only 9%, that 9% goes to the top one-tenth of 1%. Um, so what you see there is the gross inequities in our society. And what we, uh, almost surely, things are going to get worse in both dimensions. That is to say, the bottom is going to get a smaller share, and the top is going to get a larger share. But whether this occurs and the extent to which it occurs is really about policy. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, there's another way of looking at this, and that uh, looks at the share of labor. And Currently, uh, the share of labor is around 62%, a little short of two-thirds. And uh, capital share is about 21%. And rent share, this is a, a, a term that's coming more and more into uh, usage, uh, monopoly profits, land rents, uh, returns uh, that can neither be uh, related to investments on the one hand or labor on the other. It's, a, it's sort of the third part. And that's been growing. Uh, it's now about 17%. And the future, if, if we don't do something, uh, is going to be labor getting a smaller share, considerably smaller share. Capital probably won't change very much, but ranks will go up a lot. 
next monopoly profits and, and uh, all the associated things. So uh, the dismal picture that might uh, emerge if we don't manage it well is that workers will be hurt, the world of work, in two ways, lower wages and more unemployment. And uh, this is just uh, to uh, a picture of, of, of uh, 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 the kind of um, soup lines that existed in the, in the Great uh, Depression. Uh, whether the decrease in demand for labor uh, that will result from human replacing innovation results in unemployment or wage decreases will depend to a large extent on again, government policy and how flexible labor markets are. But in one way or another, workers are going to be hurt unless we put in place other policies that I'm going to describe in a minute. So um, the, the, the future is actually going to uh, uh, be bleak it will uh, if we don't have the right government policies. And the perspective that I've been putting forward is that with the right government policies in place, there can be full employment and workers can share in the future uh, of the Hanks growth. So the pie is larger. There's no reason why that workers have to be worse off. But with the wrong government policies, we will have either unemployment growing up or workers' wages going down or both. And as I said in the beginning, uh, those will, uh, uh, if, if we go those directions, it will have very severe implications for our democracy. So the point is a, really a very, very simple one. If the pie is bigger, if the size of the national pie is bigger, in principle, everybody could be made better off. But that's not the way the market economy on its own uh, uh, naturally uh, operates. And to see that in a fairly dramatic way, uh, this is a chart of, uh, for the United States, a, a, a well-known chart, uh, showing what's happened to productivity going back to 1948. And you see the uh, green curve uh, is productivity going up. And until about 1970, in the 1970s, Whenever productivity went up, compensation, which includes fringe benefits and some other things, went up in proportion. And there was a very major change in the structure of our society in uh, the late 70s, uh, beginning of the 80s, where there was a total disconnect between increases in productivity, productivity meaning the size of the pie was growing, and what workers were getting. They're, they didn't share in those increases. And this pattern is true in uh, not to the same extent, and we don't have as good data for Europe, but the same pattern is true uh, in most of the European countries, but not all. Uh, another way of uh, seeing this even more dramatically is uh, the curves in the bottom there that look like they're the horizontal axis. Those are not the horizontal axis. Uh, those are the average income, the average income of the bottom 90%. And uh, as you all know, economists do a lot of lying with statistics by changing axes and things. This is just the raw numbers as they come out. And what you see is those numbers are very low. And you can use a microscope and you can see there's some improvement. But at the top, you see what's happening to the average income of the top 1%. And uh, the obvious disparity between what's happening to the average income of the bottom 90%. We're not talking about the people at the bottom, you know, not the poverty, not the, this is what's happening to the bottom 90%. Uh, and the top is very dramatic. But the other thing I want to emphasize, and it comes out more dramatically in some other data uh, that I can't, don't have time to go through here, well, I'll come up, uh, 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 in some other data, um, is that there are large differences 
among the advanced countries. And this is a graph that looks on the horizontal axis as income inequality, on the vertical axis is social mobility, which is a way of equality of opportunity. Uh, and what you see is that, and the income inequality is measured by a standard metric called the Gini coefficient. And the social mobility is the correlation between a parent uh, and his child. Okay? Uh, the big two points I want uh, to get out of that uh, figure are that there are very big differences in, uh, amongst the advanced countries in the degree of inequality. And why I stress this is the global forces that we're talking about, globalization, changes in technology, are global. They're affecting all the advanced countries in a similar way. And yet, how they get translated into economics is very different. And the second one is that there are the huge discrepancy differences in social mobility and opportunity. And that uh, the other thing should be very clear is countries with high levels of inequality, like the United States, have low levels of equality of opportunity, of social mobility. So uh, when I talk about the United States, uh, the, America likes to think of itself as the American dream, everybody equality of opportunity, but the life prospects of a young American are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in almost any other advanced country. So I tell my students there's really one important decision you have to make in your life, which is to choose the right parents. <laughs> and if you mess up on that, the game is over. Uh, it's not quite that bad, but... but uh, now, one of the very disturbing things which highlights um, uh, the, one of the aspects of, uh, I've been emphasizing the importance of politics is you see this, this uh, the uh, blue bars are the uh, uh, level of inequality by the standard measure of Gini coefficient uh, in mid-1980s. And the orange bars are the current uh, levels of inequality. And what you see is that those societies, like the United States, with a high level of inequality, are also societies that have let inequality get worse. And not a surprise. The implication of, the, of this graph and, and, and this graph is that inequality is a matter of choice. It's what we do. It's our policies. And in democracies where societies where there's a high level of inequality of income and wealth, that income and inequality, uh, income and wealth inequality, gets translated into politics. And so the, um, uh, those at the top shape the rules of the game. Uh, they shape the policies. And the result of that is you get increasing uh, inequality. Um, that uh, there's, a, in a way, a vicious uh, uh, circle here. Um, that societies uh, like the Scandinavian societies that have managed uh, to maintain high levels of equality tend, not always, but, but have a, a force to maintain uh, uh, that kind of e uh, equality. Uh, what I want to emphasize is more than just a matter of redistribution. We talk about redistribution, uh, and that's uh, clearly uh, important, but it's also a matter of the basic rules of the game and how you structure society. So this graph, uh, as one example, is the difference between the tuition fees um, at the undergraduate level in two parts uh, of the UK, England and Scotland. And obviously, that can have an effect on equality of opportunity going forward. Um, the, uh, so th th when we come to think of the basic uh, rules of the game, you have to understand that uh, uh, markets don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, if you think of the market as a game, any game has to have rules and regulations. Markets have to be structured. 
And the way we structure markets affects both the efficiency of the game and the efficiency of the economy, but also how the fruits of that economy uh, are shared. Uh, so, uh, and this goes to every part of our legal and economic structure, from monetary policy to corporate governance, bankruptcy law, antitrust, which affects uh, competition, uh, to uh, uh, labor law. So, uh, um, obviously, there are policies that can increase the demand for unskilled labor and that can increase uh, the return to uh, unskilled labor that can increase the bargaining power of workers. So if the economy is run tight, so the unemployment rate is relatively low, that increases the bargaining power of workers. If we have international agreements where we, we have in the United States where American firms investing abroad have more better property rights than if they invest at home, that makes it more credible that a firm says, if you don't take a lower wage, I'm going to move abroad. Uh, that weakens workers' bargaining power. Uh, when we change the rules concerning unionization or collective bargaining, that weakens uh, workers' bargaining power. Uh, at the same time, if we don't effectively enforce antitrust policies, we have monopolies, which we do. I, that, that large percent that goes into rents was included in monopoly power. They raise prices. That lowers real wages just as much as a lower with a nominal wage does. In other words, real wages is wages divided by prices. And if you increase prices, that lowers real wages. And so if you have a lot of monopoly power, and the, there's been a large increase in monopoly power in the United States, I haven't studied it in the UK, but in the United States there's been a large increase in monopoly power, that lowers real wages and that leads to more inequality. So um, all these are uh, many examples of how the basic rules of the game have exactly at the time when they should have been done to address the problems of uh, uh, deindustrialization, uh, labor replacing innovation, made things worse. And we're just getting a picture of how much worse things could go in the future. So um, another aspect of this is uh, policies to sustain the economy at the full employment. Uh, to give you uh, a couple of examples, uh, mono monetary policy that focuses exclusively on inflation and doesn't talk about unemployment is really the effect of that is to lead to a higher average level of unemployment and weaken the bargaining power of workers. Uh, if you have uh, fiscal policies that unnecessarily introduce austerity, as has happened in many countries in Europe, uh, you have what I call deficit fetishism, not a balanced account, uh, then that depresses aggregate demand, and that increases unemployment, and that weakens the bargaining power of workers, so workers get hurt uh, in, in two ways. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and uh, there's a growing sense that uh, conventional policies may not be enough. Uh, there's a lot of discussion beginning now in the United States of uh, a guaranteed right to a job. And, uh, you know, some people say, can we afford it? India, much poorer uh, than the United States or the UK, has introduced a rural employment guarantee scheme that guarantees 100 days of work to the 800 million people that live in the rural sector in India. Not a perfect, but they could afford it, and it has had an effect of raising wages in the way that one would have anticipated it, it would. So in the United States now, there is a growing, uh, uh, in the progressive, I don't want to say not Trump, and this is not a, uh, but in the progressive uh, movement, there's a growing sense that maybe uh, we ought to be exploring uh, a guaranteed employment, not necessarily at 40 hours a week, but at some uh, uh, level of uh, um, 
uh, commensurate with uh, where we could be. So the bottom line is that uh, with the right policies in place, AI can usher in a new era of shared prosperity uh, with meaningful work for all of those who desire it. Uh, without the right policies, the kind of dystopia towards which we have been moving will only get worse. So I, I, I th just welcome your having this discussion of the future of work, because I think there is no issue that is more important, not only for the economy, but for our democracy. Thank you. Mr. Stiglitz, thank you uh, very much for a really thought-provoking and interesting lecture. In the interest of getting to the discussion as quickly as I can, I want to move on now to introduce uh, our respondent, Professor Diane Coyle. Uh, Professor Coyle is the Bennett Professor of Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. Her work in economics and the policy consequences of that have had substantial impact. She's had many public service roles, and at the beginning of this year, she was awarded a CBE for her, her work in economics and in the public understanding of economics. And it's a great pleasure to invite her to address you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so my job um, is to uh, kick off the discussion, as if you need it, uh, with a few brief comments. And I want to pick up on exactly the point where Professor Stiglitz left off and talk about policies and make three points about the kind of policies we should be thinking about now to deal with the prospects of what AI is going to do to the future of work. I grew up in a Lancashire mill town in the 1960s and 1970s, and in 1978, there were 28 cotton mills around town, and three years later, there were two. And so I know that you should never minimise the disruption costs of these waves of, of technology and trade affecting people's jobs. But the question, as we were just hearing, is... Is AI a technology like alarm clocks, or is it a technology like ATMs? And let me explain. Even before my day in those Lancashire cotton towns, there were people called knocker-uppers who used to go around with a big stick and bang on upstairs windows to make sure that everybody got up in time to get to the mill, because if you missed getting there on time, you got fined. And a key technology, the alarm clock, made those people completely redundant. Nobody does that job anymore. When ATMs were introduced, there were fears that there'd be no jobs for bank clerks anymore. But the evidence is really clear that actually the number of people working as bank clerks increased steadily. Because what happened was that the, the tasks that they did within their job, the same job label, changed. And they started doing things that were much higher value and serving customers better. So they weren't processing checks, but they were offering to help uh, with advice about savings and pensions. Now, we don't know what AI is going to do, and there is a really wide range of predictions. But as we were hearing, we're already in a situation where, given what's happened so far in technology uh, affecting jobs, we have been really terrible at responding to the consequences, to the disruption to people like my aunties and uncles in the 1970s and 80s, and the incomes of people who are affected. So if we're really rubbish in the past, and we know that we have this new big disruption coming down the pipeline, we should be thinking right now about what to do about it. And I'm really glad this debate is now picking up. The second point is about skills. And um, in previous historical industrial revolutions, there's um, been a long period of uh, stagnant wages, increasing inequality, disruption in the jobs that people do. And eventually that people acquire the skills that enable them to work with the technology and not be replaced by the technology. But that took five or six decades during the Industrial Revolution, and we don't want it to take so long. We want to know what now what's going to happen to the radiologists and what's going to happen to the truck drivers in five years' time. And um, it's been all talk and no action on education and skills. People have been talking, politicians have been talking about education for a long time. And we still have a system where politicians think it's really important to memorise the plot and quotations from hard times and regurgitate them in an exam. And there has been no real getting to grips with the education and, and skills and training policies we need for the people who are going to be affected by AI. The third point, and this is, goes to the, the last point that Professor Stiglitz was making, is that um, innovation is shaped as much by society as it is by technology. 
And not all innovation is socially good. In the world of finance, we think ATMs were a good thing. CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, were not a good thing. And um, we can see that some of the AI applications have absolutely wonderful potential for society. The benefits they could bring in health or transportation or energy might be really significant. We need to make sure the structures are in place for those benefits to be really widely shared. And uh, one of the ways that I'm most keen on is to think about competition. And in particular, competition over access to data, because that's one of the bottlenecks now. So we might start to think about um, uh, public data repositories and what are the conditions of access to certain kinds of databases and what are the expectations on companies that are using public data. We might think about those issues. We might even think about public service AI to change the character of competition in the market and make sure that there's somebody who's got a different business model and a different set of motivations providing innovations that are there for the public good and competing with everybody and changing the terms of competition. So those are a few ideas from me, and now I'm sure that everybody here has got lots of their own. Thank you. So let me, on everyone's behalf, thank both of the speakers for really um, interesting and, as I said, thought-provoking talks. Uh, in opening up to questions for the people in the other rooms, uh, remember there's a mechanism that we're keen that you use to get your questions through, and there's someone sitting in the front row who'll pass those on on your behalf. Um, maybe I could just cheat a little by using the chair's prerogative and, and asking the first question. For those of us who are concerned, and I think it's hard not to be concerned, having heard both of the lectures and, and, uh, and thought a little bit about it, what can and should we be doing as individuals to make a difference? Uh, well, that's uh, uh, a hard question. Uh, um, let me just say, uh, put it in, in terms of the, maybe the, the corporate uh, uh, context, um, uh, that what I said is that uh, it's how we run our society that's going to make a, a great deal of difference. And um, uh, if uh, that requires spending money on education, we talked about training and retraining people, that requires taxes. And corporations that don't pay their fair share in taxes, seems to me, are not doing their, their fulfilling their responsibility in helping us address this problem. Uh, paying uh, their workers decent wages. You know, the model of uh, shareholder capitalism has always been squeeze the workers as much as possible because your job is to maximize your return for the shareholder. But the conse societal consequences for that are very adverse. Uh, so those are you know, two examples. Uh, more broadly, I think the argument that I've been uh, putting forward is Basically, the outcomes will, be dep will depend on uh, the rules of the game that we set up. And therefore, it's really uh, the political context, it's, it's political engagement, and there's a battle. I mean, I see it very strongly in the United States where uh, we have one party who wants the rules more tilted to the upper 1% or one-tenth of 1%. And the other one is trying to uh, change it the other way. So we have a very clear battle. So anybody who, who wants to see the dystopia be brought about, they should support that other party. But if they want to have a, a, a concern about social and economic justice or don't want that dystopia, uh, there's a clear political agenda going forward. So I think, I think I'd add, be prepared to learn new things because uh, I don't think anybody can relax and assume that they're going to carry on doing what they're doing now for the rest of their career. My 20-year-old is trying to teach me some new programming languages with very limited success on my part. Um, uh, but the other thing is about thinking in terms of collective organisation, because as individuals, there's a limit to what we can do. But one of the lessons of the Industrial Revolution was that those terms of the rules of the game started to change when people got, got together, they formed philosophical societies, they formed unions, mutuals, cooperatives. So thinking about how collectively we can come together and make sure that the rules of the game work for the benefit of most people. Thank you. Let me open up to questions from the 
audience, front row. So I can't help noticing that this disconnect between uh, median wage and productivity uh, was in the 70s or late 70s. And it's about the same time that Reagan and Thatcher both uh, were in office and uh, instituted policies that favored, you know, very sort of strong right-wing free market policies. Uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union and, uh, you know, communist countries, uh, they seem to sort of uh, felt that they had some sort of, some truth uh, in their policy. They felt vindicated. And what strikes me is that the Scandinavian countries today are moving more to the right. Uh, they're, they're saying they can't afford all these social benefits. They can't afford, you know, sort of uh, educa free education, etc. So in a way, we're, we seem to be losing this you know, war of ideas, and I wanted to know what you think of that. So I think uh, the reason that for the movement towards the right is that even in the best performing societies, the Scandinavian uh, countries, there is uh, a sense of fear about their future, uh, including the future of work, but also uh, the migration crisis was a very trauma uh, you have to understand it can be a trauma in people's mind even when it's not in reality. And it can be a trauma that can be amplified by bad-meaning politicians. So, for instance, in the United States, you know, you, you've all heard about the build the wall, keeping out uh, the Mexican migrants. When he started talking about that, we hadn't had a migration from Mexico for eight years. So it was a problem that had disappeared. But it was... Uh, there were a lot of people who f were anxious about their job. They displaced that anxiety to say, oh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's others, it's trade, it's immigration. So I think, uh, so my response to you know, say the, the issue about whether we can afford it, I, I would say we can't afford not to do it. So it's not about what we can afford. Let me put it a slightly different way. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, the United States had a much higher debt GDP ratio, about 137 percent. Our per capita income was a fraction of what it is today. And yet we said to everybody who had fought in the war, which was every young man and a lot of women, you could get as much education at the most expensive school that you can get into for as long as you can, you know, get admitted uh, and the government will pay for it. So if we can afford it then, we can afford it now. And, you know, to fit in with what Diane said, uh, that turned out to be very important in restructuring our economy from agriculture to a manufacturing economy. That was really the critical skill uh, transition. So that's why I think that, uh, the, you know, I, I can't answer how do I win the debate uh, in Scandinavia, but I, I can tell you what the economics is very clear, that it's, it's very clear that this is a good use of our money. Just that it's the political trends everywhere make it all the more important that new technologies start delivering economic growth and that those benefits turn into higher wages. Thank you very much, Tara Alice from McKinsey. Um, you've both emphasized skills, which makes a lot of sense. Education is, of course, part of that, but the working age population is also a part of that. And we know that almost 80% of the people who are going to be in the workforce in 2030 are already there. The UK government spends 0.01% of GDP on workforce skills. And it seems to be a typical market failure where the employers think governments should pay for it, government thinks employers should pay for it, or individuals should pay for it. Individuals probably think that it's some combination of all of the above. How do we square that circle? My answer is very simple. I think governments should pay for it in this kind of context. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Diana's right. I mean, the, and there's a good economic theory behind that, which is in a world of mobility, uh, Companies are not going to have the incentive 
to provide that kind of education, knowing that there's a 20 to 50, 80 percent chance that they're going to be leaving. And they will want to teach you very specific skills, but not the general skills that will maximize your productivity. Let's take some questions from the other rooms. Trudy? Thank you. We've got loads of good questions. So I'll start with um, the f one that's come from both rooms, actually, which is, should we consider universal basic income as a way to face the automation of labor? And is it possible without leading to inflation that negates the effects? Joseph, that's something you might have thought about before. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm actually opposed uh, to UBI as the solution because it goes back to the title of this whole uh, uh, discussion. It's about the world of work. UBI lets the government off from the responsibility of running the economy to make sure that everybody who wants gainful employment should have uh, a job. Uh, I think uh, that there is dignity to work and that work is an important part of most people's sense of well-being. Uh, some of uh, my younger students uh, tell me that that's very uh, 19th or 20th century and that they can leave a perfectly meaningful spiritual life uh, on UBI. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and so, you know, I, I'll leave it for you guys to decide, but, but for me, uh, work is important. And uh, I, th I think letting, government off of the responsibility of creating an economic system that provides work for everybody who wants a job is a mistake. It lets the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs off the hook as well, doesn't it? They can say that's an easy solution to the problem. So I'm not in favour of it either. It's an individual solution to a problem that's social, really, and collective. And I prefer to think of universal basic infrastructure, which means that everybody has access to the transportation, the broadband they need, but also the soft infrastructure like healthcare and education, and make sure it's the government's job to make sure everybody has access to at least a minimum offer there. Thanks. Maybe one more question from yeah. the other rooms? Actually, it's funny because the same kind of questions are coming from both rooms. So again, I'll combine these. Um, coming from the conference room, it's how do you think the timeline of automation will look within and between countries? And then backing that up in the Cohen room, it says, should we be worried that AI services developed in China, which is set to become the global leader, will not be translatable to the kind of data produced in the West? So let me begin with the second question, because I think uh, that is of increasing concern. Uh, the, the following issue, uh, AI depends very heavily on big data, and having lots of data. And uh, China uh, doesn't have uh, the concerns about privacy uh, that uh, we have, let alone Europe. And that gives them, you might say, a, a competitive advantage. You know, in doing uh, genomic re gene research on genes, uh, they can ask uh, or demand that everybody in their country spit and collect the DNA from everybody overnight. Very hard for us. You know, we have to do it surreptitiously uh, to try to get the DNA. And uh, we've been engaged in trying to do it surreptitiously, but uh, we, we we still are not anywhere near what they can do. Uh, what that highlights is that different economic and political regimes uh, have really difficult problems having what you might call a level playing field in international trade. And um, there will be pressure, <clears throat> particularly in the United States, to imitate the Chinese model. And I think it's really important for Europe where there's greater concerns about privacy, to remain firm on this and to say uh, it is uh, an unlevel playing field and we will uh, impose um, re trade restrictions of one form or another to level the playing field for the unfair advantage that the lack of privacy in China gives. I know it's, it's not a free trade view, but I don't think you can have a, 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 perfectly free trade in worlds with that different uh, regulatory uh, environment. The second part of the question I, I want to, uh, one of the real concerns I, I, that uh, is being raised 
um, is the use of AI uh, to engage in exploitation. Um, and uh, for instance, in discriminatory pricing, we're all familiar with it in the context of the airlines, uh, where uh, as you search, they figure out who, uh, and they're changing the prices that you can get, and you have to search on different computers so you can try to outsmart them. Uh, but I'm sure they're gonna figure that out too. Uh, but uh, the, the fact is th the economic implications of this are very profound because the, uh, all our theorems, all our ideas about what makes for an efficient economy is the price system, that everybody pays the same price. That means that the value of a good to everybody is the same. If you can dis engage in rampant price discrimination, you are really undermining the basis of the efficiency of a market economy. So, uh, Ironically, AI, when it's abused, and it is being abused, is undermining uh, the basis of the success of the market economy. So I think this is very complicated. I'm not completely sure of what I think. If China develops fantastic services based on AI that it then exports and consumers in the US or the UK can, um, can use those, then that's terrific and I don't have a problem with that. Um, but there are, you know, as, as Professor Douglas was saying, some really complicated further questions about it, and I don't think we entirely understand what's going on or the extent to which those are necessarily bad things. You know, a lot of these services are provided for free. Um, if the uh, radiologists are out of a job, but it ends up that I get my um, uh, tumour diagnosed much faster than I otherwise would, then and the price hasn't changed, that's a really good thing. So I just don't think we know enough about how these mechanisms are playing out in the economy yet. Thanks, I want to go back towards the back of the hall, one of the microphones. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, we currently have a 42 year low of unemployment. Um, and you keep talking about how this is gonna sort of have a huge impact on and have structural unemployment effectively. When is this, when do you think this is going to affect us? Because we keep saying five years, five years, five years. Why should we change now if it's not really going to affect us now? Or is it going to hit tomorrow? Well, I don't think we can predict uh, the timing. Well, let me say, the decrease in the demand, for instance, of unskilled labor can manifest itself in two ways, uh, low wages or unemployment. And the U.S. labor market is a little bit, you might say, more flexible, and what happens is the wages go down and we have, we have uh, more inequality, the kind of thing that you saw there. Other countries have uh, uh, provided more, you might say, wage protection, but have gotten more unemployment. So I think it's already here. The real issue is the magnitude and the pace with which it could get much worse. And I think there's no way of clearly uh, uh, predicting how fast this is going to occur. There have been you know, big uh, changes in the technology that have happened very rapidly, but they have not actually been translated that necessarily quickly into the labor market. And some of it will be much slower than five years. So yeah. I think we're looking at quite an extended transition. Now, I don't think we're in a crisis at this point, except that we are in a crisis for what we didn't do 30 years ago. <laughs> And the, um, I mean, you both talked about it, the, some of the kind of mm -hmm. geographical differences, and I, I may have the statistic wrong, yeah. but I heard a statistic that in some parts of the US, the proportion of white males who had never been in work was quite, was worryingly high. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that kind of statistic, yeah. but, but it's clear it's mm -hmm. very geographic, and um, that illustrates, uh, in, you might say, a, a, an important economic principle a lot of the standard models in economics have the idea that labor moves very freely, there's you know, efficient labor markets, and no labor economist buys that model, even though many government economists do. Uh, the uh, labor has all kinds of rigidities, and that's why wages in some places are much lower than in other places. One of the reasons that manufacturing went to certain places, say in the South in the United States, was that wages 
there were low. Now, if markets were working perfectly, wages would be the same everywhere, and they wouldn't have to go to those places, but they went there because there were some structural rigidities in society in those places. Now that those jobs are gone, those structural rigidities are still there. And so the very places that were low wage 45 years ago when attracted manufacturing are now being hit, but large fractions of those workers are not skilled, they, they, they aren't able to move, and there are many other dimensions of this we haven't talked about. For instance, housing. Um, if they own their home, the value of their house in these, pro uh, in these areas has plummeted. And the growth areas are places in the two coasts, and housing there is very expensive. And they can't afford to move. So without some kind of collective action, without some government action, they're, they're almost trapped into these uh, places, and uh, uh, the result of that is you get, you know, the opioid crisis. You you have, uh, and that makes it even less attractive for businesses to move there, and you get this really vicious circle. Yeah, I, actually, I have the mic. Shall I shall I ask my question? Oh yes. Uh, I just like to profoundly disagree with both of you about UBI. I think your assumption that it'll be provided by national governments is incorrect. Uh, our own AI company is working directly on the idea of global digital currencies with minimum basic incomes based upon uh, location-based economic reality. And I think that it is wrong to dismiss your young students' view on this, and it's probably time to catch up with them. <laughs> Yeah, you may be right. I'm very happy to see experiments in UBI so that we can see what emerges from them. So uh, uh, a cryptocurrency-based UBI I'm even more skeptical about than a, a, a money-based <laughs> UBI, but, but I'm very happy to see people trying it. <laughs> no, I, I, elsewhere I've expressed my skepticism of the cryptocurrencies. Uh, the very, you know, we have a very uh, good currency, the dollar, uh, and uh, we have a less good one. Yeah, you have a less good one. <laughs> but what makes for a good currency? It's a medium of exchange, a store of value, uh, and uh, the cryptocurrencies values go up and down. The only advantage that they have is crypto, and that's not even clear that that's a. But that's just the experiment. That's the beta max phase. Okay. Well, we'll take up the discussion in five years. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that would be really surprising if we didn't have a question on crypto and blockchain today. Um, <laughs> actually, I just um, had a question about um, um, from some person on LinkedIn that they're about to start UBI blockchain. I'm not sure how that's supposed to work. Uh, in any case, thank you very much for a very thoughtful uh, discussion, Mr. Stiglitz and Royal Society. Um, as far as I understand, you are not a big proponent of UBI, and you think people should have a right and dignity in work. Let's imagine AI advances to such an extent that with all our ability and all our desire to work, we are not able to contribute in any um, particular manner. Uh, do you think government should sponsor or subsidize uh, biohacking or cyborgization of humans? I don't. Well, l l let me just say, uh, I'll let Diane answer that okay. Uh, okay. question, but let me, let me uh, uh, answer. Very gracious. <laughs> uh, uh, I do think that uh, the difficulty, we may face difficulties in getting employment for everybody, and that we will, for the foreseeable future, need some systems of social protection, which you can think of a UBI, like, uh, which UBI can be a part, for those if we fail to do that. So I think we need backstops uh, in the form of, of some forms uh, of social protection. And I'm not you know, wedded to the idea that people necessarily have to work 40 hours a week. We brought down the work week from, four, from 80 to, 
to 40. Uh, there's no reason that it couldn't get shorter to 20, week, 20 hours a week. So I don't think there's any magic number here. But I think that, uh, as I said before, I think for very large fractions of the population, it is likely that work will become, continue to be an important part of their lives. And it is our collective responsibility to make sure that our economy works in ways that can deliver it. At my age, I quite like the idea of being biohacked, I have to say. Um, it's a very intriguing question. But I disagree with your premise, actually. I think work is uh, continually redefined, and work is actually what people get paid for doing, and the, com the content of that work has changed dramatically over time. So the economic question is, uh, how do we make sure there are mechanisms for humans to get paid for doing what they do that gives them meaning? Okay, we're nearly finishing. We've got one more question from another room, and then we'll have one more from uh, right at the back. This is actually quite similar to the one you originally asked, Peter, but it's about working in a primary school, um, particularly with the under-11s, um, and what they can be doing now to try and shore up their future. This is from somebody who'd very much to, like to help them move on to being happy adults. So what should very young kids be doing, or what should their teachers be help how should their teachers be helping? Hmm. I would say stop uh, thinking about educating them in terms of, of content of material that has to be stuffed in their head for them to repeat, and start thinking about um, education as, as solving problem solving techniques and rearrange from a very young age the delivery of education. Yeah, I was gonna say almost exactly the same thing that one of the things about technology exchange is that at our fingertips now we have more knowledge than the largest library used to have. So access to knowledge, we don't have to store as much in our brain, but we have to be able to, to know how to get it and how to assess it, uh, how to manipulate the information we're go, uh, getting and, and, and how to be creative with it. So the, the focal point of education today uh, is different. Um, and to pick up the other point that was made earlier, which is that if the pace of innovation does increase, and I think there are you know, reasons to believe that that may be the case, then lifelong learning becomes more important. And that means this process that Diane described of having to realize that you will have to reinvent yourself more and more times. And that will that will be much more part of where the education is going to be. And maybe the third thing to pick up the, the uh, other point is uh, uh, educate them to, uh, on more spiritual values so that if there is no work, they can still be happy. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, quite a lot of what we've heard um, has been about things that have happened over the last 30 to 40 years, you know, whether it's on housing, whether it's on the structure of economies, uh, international dynamics. And we've also acknowledged that we don't quite know how and where AI is going to impact uh, employment. Um, you know, is it going to be retirement rather than robots that uh, are problematic for truck drivers, for example, because of aging demographics. So given that uncertainty about AI and the historic biases, um, can I ask Professor Stiglitz how different his lecture would have been had AI not existed as an issue at all? Uh, that's a good question. In terms of the structure, as I said, the analytics are the same. It's the same problem that we've faced uh, with globalization. Uh, and uh, the, the, the message is that AI could and very likely will be presenting us with uh, challenges, particularly in particular areas that are greater than we've had uh, before. So uh, uh, um, the, um, uh, the process, you know, what we said before, that the process of globalization, the pro process of technical change, uh, it, is continuous. It's not like overnight we're going to lose 40% of our jobs. You know, that's not what's going to happen. But there will be particular sectors that could be hit very rapidly with lots of jobs. And that is something that could be 
uh, very uh, could could be, could happen very quickly, and in an order of magnitude faster uh, than has happened uh, in the past. So, for instance, uh, it is very conceivable to me that the conventional job of radiology uh, could disappear very quickly. You know, would you rather have your 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 MRI read by a computer that has been proven to be much better than uh, a human, uh, radiologists will still be there, but they'll have to be redefining what their, their task is. And I don't think there's been that kind of cusp on important industries uh, before uh, of this magnitude. So I think it, it, it is forcing us to think about some of the questions that we probably should have thought about at the moment we started expanding globalization 35, 40 years ago, uh, but we didn't, and now we have the advantage of hindsight to say uh, maybe this time we will get things better. Um, I agree with that, but one other difference now is the character of the markets for um, digital companies in general and, and these AI products, and that's their what we would call winner-take-all characteristics in economics. And I think it makes the job of working out how to have competing products and competitive markets harder than in the case of previous technologies. Yeah, and the problem of monopoly that I talked about before is much worse now, and the ability to engage in price discrimination did not, was not a problem 40 years ago, and that, that is a, a, a new problem. So there are lots of little, I mean, I don't say these are little, but there are lots of details of the analysis that I think have changed now. So uh, with regret, I'll have to draw things to a close because of uh, time. We've already overrun, but thank you for your uh, forbearance with that. Thanks to all of you for your involvement and engagement. Thanks to those in the other rooms. Uh, thanks also to those of you who are watching online who tried to get in. There are many hundreds of people who queued and weren't able to come in in person, and I hope you get the chance to watch it online, and thanks for your interest. Many of the themes that have been discussed today feature in a report and evidence synthesis that the Royal Society and the British Academy issued today on AI and work, and that's available. It's available from the Royal Society's uh, website um, for those of you who are interested in pursuing it further. As I said, this is the fifth in uh, the UNAI series, for which the Royal Society is very grateful for DeepMind's support. All of the lectures up until now have largely involved uh, presentations and then interactions with the audience. The two final events in the series are a chance for you, the public, to ask questions. Uh, they're held later in the year. One of them is being held in Manchester at the Royal Exchange Theatre and one in London at the Barbican, um, as I said, in a few months' time later in the year. The tickets for the Manchester event are now on sale and those for the London event will go on sale Soon, just as a bit of a heads up, the Royal Society ran an event about 18 months ago at the Royal Festival Hall. Uh, again, tickets were made available at a kind of nominal price, but just to encourage people who had got the tickets to come along. Uh, the week leading up to the event, those tickets, uh, the event was sold out. Those tickets were changing hands on the black market for more than a tickets for Adele's concert at the end of that week. Um, so there may be a lot of demand for these events. It, it's, it's again a key part of the Royal Society's vision to engage in a debate to encourage exactly the sorts of conversations that we've been having this evening. So I want to finish having, uh, once again, thanking all of you, but to thank uh, very much both of our lecturers this evening. It's been an extraordinary uh, opportunity to hear your thoughts and your wisdom, very, uh, in both cases, extraordinarily wise and, and, and considered views on what is for us, I think, one of the, if not the major challenges we have in society. So please join with me once again in thanking both of the speakers. <laughs>